Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of CNB Bazaar Buzz here on the NDTV network. I am Cyrus Dabur and here's what we got on the show for you today. The new Honda Jazz facelift. The Suzuki Bergman takes on the TVS N Talk 125. And the new way of putting fuel in your car and bike. So let's start off with that big main story we have for you this week, the Honda Jazz facelift. And the facelift isn't major, it's just a little mild midlife uh, update for the car because it does take on the likes of the i20 and the Baleno and those are big competitors. So what's new? Have a look. The 2018 Honda Jazz facelift has arrived and unlike the usual MMC or minor model change that takes place halfway through a car's generational lifespan, this one is just an update. Now the Honda Jazz was always a capable and well-appointed premium hatchback, though we have argued about how it could have been better in dynamic terms and on some equipment. While the dynamics have not got that booster I'd have liked, the equipment certainly has and to qualify as a facelift there is some tweaking on the exterior too very few things have changed on the outside you get chrome door handles now you also have two new colors there's this the lunar silver and then there's a new red but i think the most distinct change that's very noticeable is that the tail light has changed you get this new signature from the led as well even though the overall housing doesn't change in terms of shape the light itself looks very different, but I have to say it kind of transgresses into Volvo territory just a little bit. Yep, that is it when it comes to styling changes. So you can stare at it all you want, but you won't be able to pick out any differences in the face. And that's because there aren't any. And no, still no DRLs on this baby, even at the top spec. Maybe the actual MMC would bring those in, considering the Hyundai i20 and the Maruti Suzuki Baleno have got them. That tail light cluster does bring some sexiness to the car though, and better congruity between the two split parts, the vertical element that travels up the edge of the rear windscreen and the wider cluster that sits on the fender. Honda is calling them LED wing lights and it makes the car look more modern for sure. On the inside is where the bigger changes are. The most significant is what Honda says is its DigiPad 2.0. This is the upgraded infotainment touchscreen with navigation. Now a 7 inch screen with Apple CarPlay, Android Auto. It also has reverse camera display and works with voice commands. The steering also gets cruise control functions besides audio and phone controls. The push start button now illuminates in red like in the city but it's still missing on the petrol top spec strangely so not on the car I have with me. A front center armrest and a driver side vanity mirror round off the new features. The Jazz continues to lead on safety with pretty much all features as standard across all grades of the Jazz. Yes, that includes not just the dual airbags and ABS, but also the new features like rear parking sensors and speed sensing door locks. Honda says it's also worked on reducing the noise that seeps into the cabin, although any change here is not really apparent. The new cruise control I mentioned is only on offer on the CVT and diesel variants. Overall, the car remains easy to drive and maneuver. It has a light zippy feel and its performance is rather smooth on the whole. I'd have liked to see Honda stiffen the ride a bit too and give us torter handling on the Jazz. And there are no other mechanical changes anyway, with the Jazz still offering its 1.2 litre 89 bhp petrol and 1.5 litre 99 bhp diesel engine options. I wish Honda would consider a Jazz RS by adding the more powerful 1.5 liter IV Tech engine from the city to this lineup. It would also give the Jazz a huge advantage and make it one of the seriously fun premium hatchbacks to drive. Oh well. On the whole, the Honda Jazz remains a credible and convenient car which offers a good alternative to the rest of the premium hatch crop. 
prices for the diesel go from 8 lakh 5000 to 9 lakh 29000 rupees while the petrol range starts at 7 lakh 35000 and tops off at 8 lakh 99000 rupees ex showroom its petrol CVT option remains a good choice too and Honda could consider bringing in its diesel CVT USB from the Amaze to the mix to really shake things up against the i20 and Baleno. Small changes, yes, but some of them do change your driving experience quite a bit. Now we move from four wheels to two and it's one of the most awaited scooters in recent times it's the suzuki bergman now it's a maxi scooter just like the kinetic we had many many years ago it's a large big bodied scooter but still a 125 and that means it takes on the n 125 from tvs how's it how does it compare well kinshuk has been riding around and here's what he thinks of it the return and resurgence of the humble scooter has meant that we have more options more style and also more substance in the scooter bazaar. Scooters are practical and convenient too and given their share of the two-wheeler market, we now have new models coming at us all the time. Manufacturers have now realized India's need for scooters which are a tad sportier, lean towards performance and yet have some practicality with a good amount of features. The 125cc scooter segment in India is hotting up and how? And the newest kid on the block is the Suzuki Bergman Street. It is the first ever 125cc maxi scooter to be launched in India. But does it have the goods to be the new benchmark in the segment? Because it goes up against the TVS Entoc, which is right now one of the best 125cc scooters. The Suzuki Bergman Street's biggest USP is the way it looks. It is the first ever 125cc maxi scooter in India. The front apron is angular and houses the neatly integrated LED headlamp and turn indicators. The muscular front end is topped off with a fly screen that gels well with the overall look. The end torque on the other hand is edgy and very stylish. TBS has upped the design game with this offering for sure and the scooter sure gets noticed. With its design inspired by stealth jets, the end torque looks sharp and is more pleasing to look at with better proportions. Now we have to give it to the Bergman Street for just sheer presence. The maxi scooter proportions make for a wide seat with lots of room and a comfortable riding position. The end torque has a comfortable position too, but feels a little bit cramped at the footboard. But the thing that sticks out like a sore thumb the Bergman's proportions, well, the body is quite big and the rear wheel too small. In fact, the Bergman uses a 10-inch alloy at the rear, which is way too small for the wide rear of its design. The Suzuki shares its engine and chassis with the stablemate Axis 125 and to be honest, the n -Torque and Bergman Street are more or less evenly matched when it comes to engine specs. TVS claims a fuel efficiency figure of 60 km per litre for the n -Torque while the Bergman Street claims 53.5. We absolutely loved the performance of the end torque ever since our first ride in February. The throttle response is sharp, no vibrations even at the top end of the rev range, but with an extra weight of 8 kgs, the end torque loses out to the Bergman in outright acceleration. It does have a better top end though, and in terms of maneuverability, the end torque feels easier to handle, especially in traffic. The n also offers better ride quality than the Bergman Street. It has the right amount of balance, it takes on potholes, bumps confidently and is eager when showed a corner too. The Bergman Street is easy to dip into a corner and can hold its line. And while its ride quality is slightly stiffer, that's definitely not a deal breaker. In terms of features, it is the TVS n which is the clear winner, thanks to the Smart Connect system which can be paired with a smartphone. Also, the n has a marginally bigger underseat storage space. But the n misses out on LED headlamps, which is a standard fitment on the Bergman Street. The Bergman Street also has two cubby holes to keep knickknacks along with a 12-volt socket on the front. 
and like on the Antorq, it gets the optional USB charger. So both scooters so evenly match and offer some unique USBs that it makes it rather difficult to declare a clear winner. But one of the biggest factors for any scooter buyer? Price of course. The Ntorque 125 is approximately 8,000 rupees cheaper than the Bergman Street and for that price, it packs in a whole lot of value for money. But if you want to flaunt your style and get some street cred to boot, then spending the extra dosh may just be worth your while with that first Maxi scooter from Suzuki.